Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted to be joined by two poets, Victoria McNulty and Kevin Graham, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you very much Paul. We that. like a bit of culture on a state of mind, don't we? But that's, you didn't usually introduce me as a poet. I'm, uh... <laughs> I think the people that listen to a Celtic State of Mind have probably, you know, seen your development throughout the podcast to be fair. Definitely I because it sort of, the podcast started when I first started Trying to sell myself off as a poet. Maybe. Sell yourself off, Kevin. <laughs> Come on, you could sell describe myself. it better than that. We're going to be talking about all things Celtic. We had our last bulletin on Friday with Danny Lennon and Graham Diamond. Kevin, what was your thoughts about Danny Lennon? I thought he was brilliant. It's fantastic to hear guys like Danny and uh, Graham speak about youth football. And I was mm-hmm. really, really interested in the Colt idea. Mm-hmm. And coming for a Coming for Clyde, who obviously have seen what Celtic and Rangers are actually proposing, then you, you seem to think now it's going to be a go that mm-hmm. these Colt teams are going to get into the lower leagues. And I know that a, a lot of the lower league fans won't like it, but it's all down to finances at the end of the day, and it's all down to giving these players chance to develop. And I thought it was really interesting as well when you hear Danny and Graham when they're speaking about it. They missed the reserve league. And it's something that this podcast has been banging on about, that the Reserve League yeah. is maybe the reason why Scottish football is nowhere it, where it was. I think and it's one of the reasons, mate, definitely. I mean, you look at these guys, you mentioned Liam Morrison and Barry Hepburn going to Bayern Munich, and I'm, I'm no up on my German football whatsoever, but they're probably, they will be playing competitive games probably mm-hmm. in, in Germany. It's, uh, there seems to be a better stepping stone uh, all around Europe than what, than what seems to be in Scotland and England. And you've got to begin to have a look at the academy system now, the development league system, mm-hmm. and go, why is there so many young British players going to Germany now? Obviously, they're getting a good football education in Scotland and England. But what these German clubs are offering, guys like Jaden Shanso and uh, Liam Morrison and Barry Hepburn, must be far better at that age than what uh, the elite, and, uh, Scottish and English clubs are offering these guys Billy Gilmore as well but obviously Billy Gilmore seems to be an absolute uh, uh, he, he seems to be the exception to the rule with these young laddies that go end up going down to England they sometimes just end up getting lost Yes, I, I think so and again, I'm not speaking from experience, I'm speaking Kevin through you know, chatting to guys like John Joyce who watched the development of Billy Gilmer uh, and these people reckon he was a step a, above many of the other names that, that we're familiar with. I think even further back than that, I think back to Ryan Gold going over to Sporting Lisbon um, as a young kid at Dundee United as well. He'd obviously already had his first team experience but he was lost to the Scottish game in many respects. I know he came back uh, briefly to play for Hibs, but I always felt that he was going to be a Scottish stalwart and he left. It didn't work out at Sporting Lisbon, but he got a good education there and he, he seems to be doing pretty well uh, oh, you know, right. now that he's moved on and he's getting the first team football. My biggest concern, I'm glad you brought it up uh, because it wasn't really on the agenda, but it is always on the agenda, is the, the fact that we are now just like every other club in that we're there for the taking when it comes to youth talent mm-hmm. and these big elite clubs as as we continually hear them being called I think Celtic are an, uh, an elite club uh, you know that's the way I yeah, look at Celtic mm-hmm. we might not be in a, an elite league easy for me to say but um, we certainly are in that category as a club but we are now being pilfered by these bigger clubs or these richer clubs let's get that one right as well uh-huh. uh, and you know it's only a matter of time before the, even Dembele's been uh, in the in the kind of news in terms of maybe wanting away, they they see kids who maybe they don't regard as being on the same level as them, but they're the same age, Kevin, and they're getting a ridiculous increase in wages, which is obviously a massive factor in it. But they might have a better chance of football, first team football, maybe not, but football regularly, because these guys are just not playing. If they're not in the first team, and they're not going to progress or develop any further in the so called development leagues playing against kids of their own age, then there is a void. And there's a void there. It doesn't help guys like Tommy Roger either, who we're going to be speaking about on the podcast, or Sorrow, because the big thing with Sorrow is you, we can't write him off, we've not seen him, mm-hmm. because he's not playing. If you don't play for the first team at the moment and you're in that category, you simply don't play. How are we going to get Lee Griffiths fit? How are we going to get him match fit? 
if he can't play matches. And that is the void that Danny Lennon spoke uh, yeah. well about, being from what we would class maybe as a provincial club, but not saying we can't have Colt teams in the league. So it wasn't all about self-preservation with Danny, or Graham Diamond, to be fair. Uh, Victoria, when you think back to the good old days, as we... Uh, call them Kevin and I in our 40s and all that like the Celtic <laughs> dads that we get called regularly <laughs> on the Celtic state of mind. I don't think we are although we are both Celtic fans and both That's parents so <laughs> um, what do you think yourself I mean I don't I think we're going so far down the line we can't go back to having a reserve league because there's so many clubs wouldn't be able to finance it uh, I think in a more general terms actually that there's something has to be done to completely restructure happening in football mm. in Scotland. I don't see um, the way the league is kind of set out, the way the kind of structure set out. I don't see it as sustainable. And the most sustainable and logical way for me is yet to play young players and give them the chance of a career as in they're playing football every week. As you say, they're no bench, they're no sitting, becoming unfit, becoming demoralised. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure I didn't listen to the podcast, um, but I think it's certainly up for suggestion. And it's certainly more like a, a kind of European style approach to sort of mm-hmm. like lower league and things like that. And it certainly seems to work in the likes of Germany. So It does work and it works yeah. in Spain. And the big thing for me, and I remember doing a, a bit of research on um, Jock Steen's proposal back in 68. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure the viewers will. I only wrote the book, I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> uh, anyway, I did do the research back then. I, just, I think it was 1968 that there was actually an official proposal. Uh, to get the Celtic reserve team, who at that time were the Quality Street gang, into the lower reaches, which was the second division at that time. And there was loads of, I mean, Jockstein wasn't doing it um, just for his own benefit. He was looking at the fact that if the Celtic reserve team at that point was playing Kevin in Stenhouse Muir, for example, or or Alawa, there was going to be a far greater crowd at that game Mm -hmm. than even Alawa v Stenhouse Moor, although it's a kind of local derby. And it was proved in the way that Steen did it, because he's such a forward-thinking guy, he, he actually organised a series of friendly matches with lower league opposition to, to show two things. Firstly, that the uh, the kids, the Quality Street kids, could compete. And then secondly, that they would draw a crowd. And he was proved on the two points. They were going out and beating Alawa's first team. Um, convincingly if you look back on the I think it's on the Celtic Wiki the actual game itself I think it was you know high, quite a high scoring game 5 or 6 nothing Quality Street Gang beating Alawa's first team and a, a, a guy called Ward White who's in the book quite uh, prominently scored a hat trick that day they played Stenhouse Moore. they went around playing all these teams and they played friendly games against English clubs so they were coming up against teams like Carlisle United and you know beating them 2-1 now, Carlisle obviously were a strong English side mm-hmm. and the Quality Street kids were going down and beating them. Mm-hmm. So then Steen had his evidence. He then presented it as a proposal and it went to a vote. And the, and the team that had an issue, the biggest issue with it was Partick Thistle back then. And their argument was, you're taking fans that might come to Fur Hill away from us. I'm pretty sure that wasn't the case, but no. it fell down. It shows you how forward-thinking Jock Steen was that we are now still talking about that Similar proposal, Kevin. I know, it's just like trying to reinvent the wheel, eh? Mm-hmm. I mean, you listen to these geniuses. You listen to guys like Ferguson, Steen, Shankly. You look, you, look, you look at Shankly, especially the amount of players that he brought through at Liverpool. How he used the reserves at Liverpool. Mm-hmm. How, how Steen used the reserves at Celtic. I mean, these guys need football. I mean, I don't, I don't think the days of guys getting sent back to junior f- football is now there anymore that that's that was off its time I think because the standard of junior football then was probably far greater than what it is what it is now mm-hmm. but you look at Brentford for example they, they scrapped their academy and they've got a second team and they just travel around Europe playing bounce games against the elite in Europe mm-hmm. and they've seen great strides with that one of, one of the other uh, examples of forward thinking I think was the UEFA Champions League when they had whatever if you got into the UEFA Champions League your yeah. youth team also played against PSG's youth team when uh-huh. Celtic were playing that was a great that, that was a great opportunity a for, show, actually. for uh, the players to get used to travelling with the first team uh-huh. and get integrated with the first team they used to do it at under 21 level at internationals as well yeah. it, it makes perfect sense actually because one of the things you hear people saying repeatedly about Celtic in Europe is that the young players don't have the experience to compete in a European stage mm-hmm. 
but of course they don't because right. they're not playing it. it it's almost like sucking eggs of course but mm-hmm. I don't know how we would now roll that out, as you say. When you look, that's where that's where Celtic saw Odson Edward was in, in those youth team games. Yeah. It's probably where we've seen the boy backer back as well mm-hmm. in, in those games. And these games were televised as well. Mm-hmm. So they were high-profile games. And, he, and, and the young players were getting used to going into an ultra-competitive environment. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Celtic done well in some of the games, but they weren't, they weren't to the level of the PSG sides and that that were playing, they, they wouldn't be. But that, that that's the kind of level that you want to actually be you testing do. yourself. How can you test when, yourself when you're 17, otherwise? 18-year-olds, mm-hmm. that's where you want to go. Mm-hmm. So I would all be, these cult teams going into the lower leagues is all fine, but then I would maybe want a European league. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know with the current pandemic and the current, the current uh, travel restrictions, that's probably pie in the sky. But if there is a, if the, if there's a pan European league, mm-hmm. I would want to see a youth league as well following that pan European league. So if Celtic are playing in Copenhagen, the youth team's playing in Copenhagen. It's a they're good playing, shout. They're playing Copenhagen as, as yeah, well. Yeah, it's a good shout. And of course, the the high echelons of the game have they cared enough about the youth development of countries like Scotland then and others? Then obviously that would be something they should consider. I remember going to one of the games Celtic played Sporting Lisbon at Firhill. It was, and there was a kid playing fullback for Celtic who was far and away the best player on the pitch. It turned out to be Daniel Fisher, who mm-hmm. obviously went on to some success at Celtic. I think had Neil Lennon stayed around a bit longer, Fisher would have had a longer Celtic career. He's moved on and done well down in, down south as well. Um, but I think so. I think it's one of the things with regards to the Colt teams where we've gone so far without a reserve league, it would be difficult to put that back into the structure because a lot of the smaller clubs who didn't want a reserve league back in the day still don't have the finance to run a reserve team. Uh, The Colts is definitely something that we need to consider. The other thing that we said, you've mentioned the the juniors. Obviously, a lot of the the, um, junior clubs have have made their way into the pyramid system and we've spent some time with Haddington uh, recently as well. We went down to their park, Kevin, and it was lush. I mean beautifully maintained but the actual pitch was incredible and I've said this before Joe Hamill who played for Hearts Livingston Leicester and others he's a player manager down there and I asked him would you rather I named a few Premier League grounds uh, Rugby Park uh, New Douglas Park and uh, the, past, the Pasta Palace I still call it Al- Almondville because that's what's on the seats <laughs> they've never changed the seats have they um, yeah would you rather play at the three Premier League grounds or would you rather play here at Haddington in the sixth tier of Scottish football? And his answer, and he wasn't, it wasn't favouritism, he would play at Haddington every single week. So if you had an affiliation with a club who would maybe lower down the pyramid system, Kevin, maybe it's still an option. I mean, I, I get what you're saying about the junior leagues. Obviously, the junior leagues were hard and competitive, but they're now part of the pyramid. What if... Half a dozen young kids every year went down to a team like Haddington. I must admit, it's maybe just my uh, lack of knowledge of what's going on in the lower tiers mm. of Scottish football that I said that. But I have a look round about my area where I stay in Stirling, and you've got Bannockburn amateurs and you've got Malton amateurs who have got great setups, great youth academies, great facilities for kids. So I'm sure these clubs higher up the pyramid are going to have, like, the right community clubs. Yeah. And, and maybe that's where we should be getting back to as well, that these clubs do. You'll have a player come through your community club that goes on to make it. It's a pathway, it, Kevin. It, it doesn't, when he's 13, yep. all of a sudden doesn't become cannon fodder for a big academy team yeah. because there's a striker that is going to make it mm-hmm. and an academy team has to have 11 players in the park. If this if this laddie could stay at his community club till he was 16, 17, then sign that big contract rather than get swallowed up into the academy system. And it does work yep. uh, the other way. You mentioned the community aspect of it. So a lot of these clubs have got uh, teams in the community mm-hmm. who are, you know, youth teams. And there's there's rules actually with that. So the Jimmy Johnson Academy will be working with St. Rocks uh, to develop a, an under-18s, which is like a bridge between youth players and the first team. They've, they're also running, a, you know, it's a reserve team, but it's an under-20 team, uh-huh. uh, St. Rocks. So an under-18s team who then maybe go and play for Haddington, who have four or five players from, let's say, Hearts or Hibs playing for them, and it might be a gateway for their players to then make that move the other way. 
you know, if, if they're being watched, if the four or five Hearts players, let's say, are, are being watched regularly by the club, they might pick up some other, the, you know, youth talent that's coming through. I think it definitely would work and it's something that needs to be looked at because I'm getting a bit concerned that, you know, more and more Celtic youth players, uh, the cream of the crop, as it were, are flying the nest. I mean, you knew about uh, Hepburn before it broke, but, you know, we didn't say anything on the podcast because we didn't feel it was your place to say it, Kevin. Um, it's such an exciting move if you put yourself in that young kid's shoes or his family and, you know, to go away. For me, Celtic would be enough, but, you know, when you're they're dangling the carrot of the, the wages, the opportunities that they offer over in Germany um, to take that kid over, you know, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of these young players to say no. I know that his family had concerns and his family would rather he have stayed at Celtic. Um, um, when Bayern first made, well, he, he's signed now, so I can actually say it. Uh, when Bayern must have first made contact in February this year, mm-hmm. his family had concerns. Then obviously the, the, you've had the pandemic hit and he's moving to another country. But for what I can, he, for what I've been told, Bayern have bent over backwards to make sure any concerns that his family have got have been met and exceeded mm-hmm. and shown that they're not going to be any problems whatsoever. Brilliant. And, all, and also, Liam Morrison's his best pal as well. Is that right? So, Liam, that's Liam, who's in a strange country as well, now getting his, his pal across mm. to, to help them. So, Barry can adjust with Liam being there. And, and it's, it's fantastic work by, by, by Munich. No, it is. It and, is. and it shows, <laughs> maybe, maybe we should take it as a compliment that Bayern Munich are stealing guys for the Celtic Academy. Well, maybe it shows we are doing something right. We're doing right. something right, but then we need to find a way to prevent it as well. You know, um, I th- we're going to move on to have a wee chat with you, Victoria. Because it's great to have a couple of real talents in, in this room uh, to speak with. But talking of talent, we had Edgar Summertime on yesterday, Kevin. We're long-time fans of Edgar and the stuff that he does. I think a lot of people that tune in realise that we're, we're proper music heads on a Celtic state of mind. But Edgar Summertime is just an absolute genius uh, musician. We were able to record a full session, an acoustic uh, session, a DJ set, and also a Q&A, which is up on YouTube at the moment. We're going to fully produce and edit the other ones and put them out as beautiful wee nuggets that will stay there forever because the acoustic session was just absolutely incredible. And I was playing you a wee bit before you came in, Victoria. So we're all about, we're all about art and we're all about culture. And you've come on and you're going to be speaking about this wee fanzine that you've got here. We love the fanzine culture. We really do. We've spoken about it a few times on the podcast, Kevin, and I know you contribute. And in the past, I've contributed to fanzines. I was an avid Not The View man back in the day. Um, (laughs) I always remember reading Not The View and from a very young age, you you want to talk about football. You want to talk about football players. We had Paul McStay and Mark Evenet and I was reading about the board and all that kind of serious stuff. But looking back, I'm glad I had that insight. Um, into the way football really is because obviously growing up you realise it's not just about the goals and the players um, so talk to us about this beautiful wee fanzine you brought along um, It kind of came about as a result of um, lockdown mm-hmm. um, I'd noticed uh, I'm, I'm a poet um, I'd noticed very quickly that myself and loads of people round about me had completely lost their platform overnight yeah. like, it just totally disappeared mm-hmm. in the ether Um I had been noticing in the run-up to that as well, there was a kind of... When I started performing in Glasgow, there was like lots of open mics, there was fanzines, there mm-hmm. was DIY publications, and then there was like more ex- like established nights, like the likes of Sonic Youth or Noiriki in Edinburgh, yeah. where you could hone your craft and work your way up. Not so much now. And I just thought, during lockdown, I could... I want to do something about that. I want to publish people, artists that I know Mm -hmm. that are working in Glasgow and that they're doing great work. They are maybe starting out or they're more established. I wanted to publish political writing as well, Um, working class writing, stuff that maybe isn't always... And it's a small drop in the ocean, really, but it was just my way of doing something Mm -hmm. in that time. Um, But it's garnered a bit of interest and it's out now, so... It's kind of worked out okay. Where can people pick this up? Um, off our Twitter. Yeah. Um, the uh, email, my email, well, our email address and things like that is on my Twitter. And if you send us an email, I'll send you a PayPal link and you can brilliant. pick it up. No, brilliant. So you get following Victoria McNulty. Now, 
I'm going to put Kevin on the spot. I'm good at doing that. The, the wee story I told you about uh, before, Kevin, get yourself prepared. You got your glasses on. Nice one. Um, as we were doing a gig in front of what was it? Just fifteen hundred folk. Yeah. And Kevin obviously comes through, records it, and helps me drive when I've not got any questions ready and stuff like that. Um, and somebody who thought they weren't meant to be there, and the promoter thought they were meant to be there, didn't turn up. So there, there was a wee slot in the night, so Kevin ended up doing portraits to 1,500 people. Uh, and he didn't know it was going to happen, but you had your lyrics, or did you have to rewrite them? I can't I, remember. I had to rewrite them. I'm going to pass you the fanzine, because there is a poem in here called Borussia, who'll get me back something, uh, by Kevin Graham. <laughs> so come on, give us a wee rendition of that. Oh. A wee bit of poetry before we move on to Tommy Roger. Come on, because he was poetry in motion, or he might <laughs> still be. Cheers, Paul. It's all right, mate. This is... Um, I'll explain a wee bit about this, but I've, most folk have probably heard me doing f- football po- poetry, and this has got a bit of football in it, but when Victoria put the the, the, the message out that she was looking for s- some things, um, I says, I'll send this, and I'll see where it goes, and luckily enough, she thought it was good enough to actually go in to the, the fanzine. So, I've never read this one before, so it might be a bit stuttery, so here we go. Clearing out a cupboard, shoe boxes of pictures, portals to the past, I find a photograph, my only childhood birthday party. You are in the middle, the front and the centre of attention, like always. Everyone loved you, life ahead, choices to make. You said that you lost your virginity to your brother's girlfriend when he went to the shop, she was naked and horny. You said that you won a BMX from a packet of crisps. Never stole it from the new private estate. You said that you had a trial for Dundee United, but decided not to sign. Not that they didn't offer you a contract. You said that you didn't mean to punch the tech drawn teacher after she told you to be quiet. You said that that you wouldn't be a roofer with your brother all your life. You were right. In a Borussia Dortmund tracksuit, staring at the floor, rocking back and forth on the soles of old Adidas that looked too big. All bones, no shadow. All the menace of a short, transient life expectancy. I stand and wonder. Should I go over, have a conversation about the picture? Catch up, reminisce? Then I remember that I'm in a rush. My son will soon be finished at football. My daughter needs to go to gymnastics. I have a work pension, lease a Vauxhall mocker, pay everything by direct debit. I'm contactless. I'm only here to put a fiver on both teams to score. I make out I don't know you until you are in the middle, the front and centre of attention again in front of the 754 train making, all, making us all late that day. Life ahead, choices to make. Well done. That was brilliant. Thanks for that, Paul. No, that was excellent. And you can get me back someday. That was brilliant. And obviously everybody that's watching this on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube will enjoy a wee bit of your poetry from time to time. So whenever you're in, maybe we'll ask you for that every Monday. Because this is your day, Kevin. You're going to be doing the bulletin on a Monday. Yes. The Celtic State Mind Bulletin obviously is live and interactive. But uh, what we're going to try and do is, to the best of our ability, is to get it out on the same time every day on a weekday Monday to Friday 12.30 if we've got a match day we'll do a wee bulletin before the match day as well because we've got all the match day things happening and on a Monday you'll be met with Kevin Graham uh, and hopefully a wee poem from time to time that was excellent well done really Thank enjoyed you. it now a lot of people are commenting so let's have a look at some of these comments and we'll see if uh, there's anything that can um, get the juices flowing uh, in relation to Tommy Rogic uh, now Sean Fox, welcome to the show, Sean. You're watching on YouTube. Everybody out there, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe. The numbers are going up and it's a great way to always watch a Celtic State of Minds content. Uh, good afternoon to you, Sean. Gary Doonan, long-time fan and friend of a Celtic State of Mind. You're commenting on Facebook. Thoughts on Beaton and Hayton playing in the Israeli back three the other night up against the guy who gave our defence a torrid time last year and supported by McGinn and Christie. Now, that, that is a very interesting point, isn't it? Um, aye, I, I must admit that both of them done really, really well. Um, if it was a game... Let's just mention the boys talking about Dykes. Yes. Dykes finally yes. got a cap for Scotland, eh? 
Yes, it was a bit isolated up there, uh, uh, Mr Dykes, um, but what really surprised me was El Hamid played on the left-hand side of a back three, mm-hmm. not the right-hand side. It was one of those games, if I didn't know who beat on and El, El Hamid were, I would have came out and gone, they two boys at the back were quite decent. They would have impressed you. They would have impressed me, yeah. So mm. they, they did. They did really. They strolled the game. Must admit, the Israeli team actually looked far better than the Scotland team. They looked fitter. Um, the Scotland team struggled. Um, the Scotland team did struggle to get into any sort of rhythm. There seemed to be a lot of shoehorning the best players into uh, the ten outfield jerseys mm-hmm. um, and no looking at their best positions. But I must admit the two the two Israeli lads done well, and now we don't really see near beat on as a midfielder, do we? We don't we actually do consider we him now. Do we count no, him as we a midfielder, eh? Well, yeah, he is, but we, we never consider him in, in there. You know whose jersey would he take? Uh-huh. Um, but it, it was an interesting point by Gary, and the reason obviously I mentioned Dykes is because it would have been a dream for me to play for uh, the Republic of Ireland when I was a young kid. Uh, <laughs> but to see Dykes on the back of that Scotland jersey, I mean, it probably still won't force me to buy a Scotland top. Nothing against Scotland, I love my country and all that, but the international thing just doesn't do it for me. I mean, um, Dykes has done well, I think he's done really well, he's got a great move. I don't know how that's going to pan out down at Queen's Park Rangers. He's probably the first with my name uh, to play for Scotland, I think. I think back in the day there was a William Dykes played for Hearts, but I don't think he was capped. Uh, and he'd done okay. I mean, mixed kind of message online. I've seen that uh, Ewan, who's been in here, uh, Ewan Beth Robertson, who came in on the bulletin, uh, was singing his praises. I think he, he rates them highly. But there was other people just see him as a big lumpy wood. I think he's going to cause problems, even at that level. At international football, the ball's got to stick. Mm. Uh, especially with Scotland, the ball's, the ball's got to stick up there. And he done well, but he got... He, um, McGinn and Christie didn't support him. No, I was watching the game and I, I, I like it. I like watching Scotland. I watch it with my pals who I didn't go to watch Celtic with. Obviously, we didn't do it at the, at the weekend. There's social distancing and all of that. But that's your I, disclaimer, yeah. Anyway, disclaimer, <laughs> aye. So I was watching it and I was really going. Stephen Naismith would have loved to play alongside Lyndon Dykes mm-hmm. on a night like Friday night. Just being close to him, getting the flick ons, getting getting the hold up play. Um, so it's maybe something that uh, Steve Clark will look at today. I don't think Naismith's in the squad actually, but it's maybe Sonny will look at today if he's going to play Dykes. They actually play two up front mm-hmm. rather than a three four three. See, when um, <clears throat> there was a, a really good point last week, there's loads of points that people totally disagree with, and we get that on Facebook and Twitter all the time. But there was a good point I think made by Stevie Mullen last week regarding Greg Taylor. Now, the left-back position is something of an issue at the moment for Celtic. Um, but he was talking about how Stevie Clark sets up his side as an ultra-defensive kind of side, or certainly did with Kilmarnock. Uh, and he does really well with that. He's been very successful for him. But, you know, Greg Taylor's not had that kind of offensive play to his game. That's not been his kind of second nature to to take on a man and swing in a pass. I think he'd done well against Hamilton in the opening day, Kevin. Um, but... Is he someone who can adapt, do you think, to the, the the forward thinking of Celtic to always be on the offensive, Victoria, or do we still need a new left back? I think that's something that it's a it's a debate that's going to rumble on because obviously we are interested in a few. There's a few names getting mentioned. What's your thoughts on the left back? And the grenade that I threw last week, unintentionally, by suggesting that we might eventually have to um Welcome, if that's the right word, bowling golly back into the squad. I've got a lot of stick for saying that, but uh, you just never know. If we can't get anybody signed up, you can't run with one left back. Yeah, and I think actually there's um, probably not one option that's actually going to solve that problem anyway. Um, I actually don't know the answer to your question, but I certainly do think that you're maybe right about bowling golly. If we can't replace them, then... The, the logical issue, the logical decision would be to play him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, you know, there's no really... Maybe it's not a problem that he's not used to being set up on an ultra-defensive side, you know what I mean? Maybe having a strong left-back is a great thing. Yeah. And somebody to actually invest in and kind of there ha- have a look at how to structure a team around the strengths that you have. Mm-hmm. I'm not entirely sure, but um, it would remain to be seen, I think. It would be interesting, I think, Victoria, um, because I'm a big fan of El Yunusi. Mm-hmm. I think El is yeah. excellent. I'm not sure 
that's his position out left. We'll need to wait and see on that. It'll be interesting when Mikey Johnson comes back in and gives us another option out there. Uh, you know, because he might take a lot of that offensive work away from Taylor. And as you say, he can concentrate on the defensive qualities that he's got. And and perhaps Mikey Johnson will take a wee bit of that pressure off him. I mean, I'm, I'm again, a big fan of Johnson. But I think, uh, you know, this season's a big season for him, Kevin. Definitely. And I don't think it has helped that he's been injured at the start. Mm-hmm. He's kind of fell off the radar. And when we're, when we're discussing squad options, nobody's really mentioning him. Because he has been out for so yeah. long, yeah. So it's going to be, let, let, let's let's have the old cliche. Getting him back is going to be like a new signing, mm-hmm. really. Eh? Um, I like him. I think he's got a bit of talent. I think he's been much uh, maligned, really, because of the twice that he's been played through the middle at Ibrox, and people says he would never make it. Um, he had a, he had a decent game at Ibrox when we won there last season, uh, in his natural position. Uh, as a as a wide player, he's got a lot to learn. He's still a young lad. I like his tricks. I like. He looks like a Celtic player. He's he's got that. He does. He, he's got that wee gallus nature. Yeah. Uh, be a Celtic player as well. Um, how he develops. I mean, I, I, I know I know I know a couple of players who played with him at a schoolboy level and in, in Scottish international level, and they says he was absolutely unbelievable in training. Mm-hmm. They couldn't get the ball off him. He would just keep the ball for fun. So it's quite obvious that the lad has got talent. I mean, what, what do we expect? I mean, he's in a team now and he's going to have, he, can, he could have a look at Callum McGregor, James Forrest. He could be a Celtic player for life, this laddie, if he wants to be. And he could develop into a number 10. I think he's got the ability to develop into a number 10, but he needs competitive games, he needs more games because to play that number 10 role takes experience. Unless to get converted for a wide player into a number ten, mm-hmm. it t- takes a bit of effort. Mm-hmm. I do like him, and I'm looking forward to actually seeing him coming back into the Celtic squad. We're talking about a young Scottish talent who is undoubtedly a talent. Mm-hmm. I mean, you imagine him coming through the ranks. Let's say we've been speaking about Bayern Munich. Let's say he came through the ranks at Bayern Munich, and he, he made an introduction, and he scored in Europe as Mikey Johnson has. And he, and he played as many games as Mikey Johnson has played because Lennon has utilised them quite a bit. They, what would they do? This is my question. What would they do with a player like that at this stage of his development? Because I think Mikey's lightweight. I really do think he's lightweight. I think that's something that really needs to um, change if he's to be this player that you mentioned. You look at the transformation. I know Chris is an obvious one, but look at the transformation in Callum McGregor since he came into the team under Ronnie Dyla mm-hmm. compared to now. Yeah. He was actually, and I'm not going to say he's overweight, I mean, I'm not a professional footballer, but talking to some of the guys who worked with him as a, as a young guy, apparently he was always quite heavier in the middle. None of that now. The guy's an athlete now, right? And a, a lot of that, I think, was down to Brendan Rodgers and the conditioning team at Celtic Park at that stage. But he developed to the point where you take McGregor out and put him in an international team, he doesn't look out of place. If you were to take Mikey out and put him in an international situation, he might disappear because... At that stage, Kevin, everybody's an athlete. You know, there's a whole stature thing. You look how Kieran Tini developed. Mm-hmm. That skinny laddie that was coming on as a sub compared mm-hmm. to the beast that you see now. And that was in a very, very short period of time. Naturally, not everybody develops like that and they've obviously got to work on it. I think that's a big thing for Mikey. If it, and certainly if he's got to, like you suggested, Kevin, if he was to move into that position, you call it a number 10, I call it a support man role, going back to championship manager. <laughs> But going going on about this false nine last week, it, it totally passed me by. The fault, the only false nine there is is Rangers. He's nine in a row. That's the false nine. <laughs> Any other false nine is completely something completely different. That's the false nine. But I, I get what you're saying. But I think the development isn't in his talent. That's there for all to see. I think mm-hmm. it's more in his physical attributes. Yeah. Physical and game att- attributes and, and mental, uh, psychologically as well. Eh? Yeah. It's. Playing that competitive football, mm-hmm. being able to do it under pressure. It was interesting to hear Danny Lennon talking about that's the most important part of a manager's job now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a psychological yeah. part. Danny so, was good, wasn't he, last week? I really. You've had a lot of decent guys on the podcast to speak about coaching, mm-hmm. and to, with somebody like me who's never been on a football park for 18 years and never had any good coaches. I can, some of them are listening, so I'm likely to get abused. What was your record, your unused substitute record? 178 unused substitute appearances. 
That's impressive, Kevin. That's very impressive. I'm now, proud of you. Uh, you should be. Uh, we'll go back to some more of the comments coming through. And uh, Nicholas McDade via YouTube. If Thomas fit, he plays for me. He's a match winner. Well, again, I've spoken about Tommy Roderick because I was kind of resigned to the fact that he was leaving. And I thought, well, it's probably best for all concerned that he does leave. You get the £4 million reported fee, you reinvest it maybe in a new left back or another centre half because we still seem to be looking at that area of the park. But now that I've heard that the Tommy Roderick deal might have broken down, Kevin, I'm looking at myself, my question is, can we reintegrate him into Neil Lennon's plans? Can he contribute to the five tournaments that we're currently in this season? And more importantly, can he contribute to 10 in a row? He's an asset. You speak about ball and golly, and if you're, if, you're, if you're looking at players in purely materialistic form, then if you've got a player as good as Tom is, then you would hope to utilise him. Yeah. But for me, we, 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 with this move to Qatar breaking down, i am got no doubts that his agent will be phoning English clubs saying, this lad has no future at Celtic. This is the price that they're willing to accept. Do you want to take him? What level do you think he could play at down south? Um, I would, if you're going down south, you're, you're, you're probably talking about a bottom end Premiership, right? You're probably a Newcastle or somewhere like that. Mm. But then Newcastle are spending quite a, a lot of money. I saw that this morning, actually. Um, this as well, he might end up in the Championship. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for a guy who has talents, I would love to see him in La Liga, maybe a mid table La Liga team, or even go to Sierra. Yeah, because he would actually he would shine. Like a diamond there, definitely. See, this is all the, the poetry coming out there, Victoria. And uh, obviously, Tommy, Tommy Rogic, he, he is quite a poetic player, isn't he? You could write a wee poem about him. Or maybe I should. <laughs> maybe you should. You could probably write a few poems about him, to be honest. I think to answer your question, definitely, if you know fitness wasn't an issue, he could absolutely play a part in 10 in a row, yeah. to be honest. And I, I think that... With a move coming up, as you see, people started to try and imagine the squad without him, try and imagine the team kind of moving forward and who you'd put in place. But there's a, an instinct in me that's like, this is a very important year. Mm-hmm. If you can work with what you've also got, just to get it and nail it, then I think, um, yeah, I would love to see him stay at Celtic. It brings up that that point you've just made there, you know, about working with what you got. I, I guess that's what I'm talking about with Ball and Golly. Yep. Once this, the dust settled and you think, right, here we are, he's still the player, he's still the player that made an appearance against Kilmarnock this season. Mm-hmm. He's still a left back. No, the, For me, he's not the best option, but you know, he's a he's a player who could be called upon if necessary. It's better than having no option at all, Kevin. And there's obviously nothing coming through the, the youth that we've already discussed on the podcast today. There's nothing coming through that's ready. There's no players who are ready to go in, otherwise they'd be an option. Mm-hmm. And I think... When you're also looking at um, Tommy Rogic in that vein, you've you, you've kind of resigned yourself to losing him, and now you think, well, actually, he could fit in. Lee Griffiths is in that category as well because he's, it's like he's disappeared from view. Yeah. If we can get him fit, he plays a part in ten in a row as well. Or am I just wishful thinking in that respect? I don't know. I, this this is really really strange. It's a strange season because the transfer window doesn't finish till October. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot, and like a lot of the major leagues haven't started yet. A lot of them start this weekend. The Italian league starts the following weekend. So there's still teams getting their squads together. There's still teams getting an idea of where they want to be in in the next season in this completely strange time. Mm-hmm. And we've got so many questions that we can't answer. I mean, all we know is Lee Griffiths has got a calf strain, a never-ending calf strain, it seems, over the last 18 months. Well, Tom's only played 17 games last season. Yeah. He only played 16 games the season before. you've You've got to be thinking that the management have already said, we need to bring in somebody that we can rely on. Someday it's more dependable, and then what Victoria rightly says is a really, really important season for us. Mm-hmm. And if they're maybe looking at it and they're going, right, we need to balance the books here. If we sell Tom, somebody else, somebody else, and bring in X, Y, and Z, then that's the squad's going to be in a better shape. If they bring in somebody to replace Tom, it's going to play 25, 30 games a season. Mm-hmm. Maybe he hasn't got the talent of Tom Roddick, but he's going to be available. 
Yes. He's going to be available for that Wednesday night against Ross County. Mm-hmm. He's, he's not going to be halfway to Australia or halfway flying back from Australia on international duty. He is going to be there. When you look at the ball and golly situation as well, the left back situation, what happens if we score every left back that we've scouted off the list and we're left by ball and golly? This is this is a dilemma. <laughs> that, that's uh, that's a potential. We, we, we want the PSG boy. The, the PSG might not let him come. Is that a loan deal, Kevin? That the twenty-year-old, yeah, a, a loan deal. Mm-hmm. Beasley has already says that he wants Barry Douglas to stay, right. even though he's the third choice left back at Leeds at this precise moment in time. Mm-hmm. Beasley says that he wants him to stay. He's an important part of the Leeds dressing room. Right. So then, where are you going? Where are you looking? Are you just looking to get a, a body in? Are you just looking to get a number in? It's not going to improve the squad. Well, yeah. Mitchell right. Backer, 20 years of age, PSG, it would basically be us developing him for mm-hmm. another club again. De- definitely. Uh-huh. Um, whereas Bolingoli, for everything that he's done, and we're all aware of that, he is Celtic's asset at this moment in time. Is he sellable? Probably not. So you're loaning him out and it's running down his contract and it gets to the point, like Tom Rogic, where the value of that player deteriorates, doesn't it? Because he's not he's not actually playing and he's getting closer to the end of his deal. Um, the, the other thing I would ask about Rogic as well, if he stays, we're kind of top heavy in the midfield, we spoke about it last week, is it then a case, Kevin, of the the bean counters at Celtic thinking, well, let's get rid of another midfielder and Encham might be that guy. Southampton seem to have an interest in Encham. As a Celtic fan, forgetting all the, the financial element of it, I'd like to keep them both. Yes, but we are run like we are running as a business and we're we're sometimes lucky to be running running as a business. And any any business any transfer business that we're doing this summer, it will be balanced off. Mm-hmm. And as Celtic fans, we've, we've probably meekly come to accept that's going to be the case. Yeah. That if we spend £20 million, pound, we're going to sell £30 million pounds worth of talent. Yeah. Because that's what we do. That's It's the only part of, I've said a, a few times, it's the only part of the model that works. We, we, we get a clear shot. For the last nine years, we've had a clear shot at the Champions League. And we've only made the Champions League group stages twice. Mm-hmm. So... The only part of Celtic's business model that works is that we dominate domestically and we sell players for a profit. They, us portraying ourselves as a Champions League club is false. We're a decent Europa League side. I like the Europa League and I've said that before. And I, I, hope, to, I hope in the name of Owen Archdeacon that we manage to get into the, the Europa League stages. Because that's where we need to test ourselves as well. In the name of Owen Archdeacon. I know, I was trying to think of a random Celtic 1980s player there. And first Owen, thing I thought about... Owen, Owen Archdeacon jumped First thing in. I and thought he's about... He's got a kind of religious name, He Archdeacon. does, that's he does, so but he had the number 13 shorts on. He nicked a free kick and scored against Rangers. So thanks for bringing that to my mind. <laughs> uh, can you remember that goal? I do, yes. Who yeah. was in goals for Rangers? Was it Chris Woods? Chris was Woods. it his first season, I think? I think it would be Chris Woods. Thanks for sharing that with us, Kevin. In the name of Owen Archdeacon. I'm sure we'll hear that again. Um, I'll use it again, definitely. Right. Now, I'm going to have to apologise to people watching at home because they're going to have to see me on a big screen just for a moment while I reset your camera because for some reason it's dropped out. So at the moment, we can still hear you guys. All right? We can still hear you. Um, And we've now got two of me on the screen. So we're going to... um, Go for a, a short break. Keep talking, though, because we, could, we still have the mics on and we'll get you back in the room. So my big concern with that, with regards to um, the Tom Rogic scenario, is that we might then try and cash in on Olivier Encham. There is apparent interest from uh, Southampton. And I think that um, at that particular stage, if we were to sell him, my biggest concern, Kevin, is the fact that they're only talking about £5 million. For... For... In Cham. In Cham. I, I've never heard that, and that seems a bit low, considering Porto and Leon are seemingly interested in, as well, and Leon were willing to spend fifteen million reportedly last summer. At, no, Porto were willing, willing to spend fifteen money, fifteen million last summer as well. So I think that's a bit low, and also when you look at what the money Southampton have gave us previously. I mean, they gave us £8 million for Stuart Armstrong. And Armstrong is now one of their most important players. Uh, so, 
that's you, you've got that. Um, and Southampton know what they get from Celtic yep. as well. They do, um, but again, you know that that was newspaper reports, and it's gone from twenty to five. So I think that uh, somewhere along the line, there's a wee bit of uh, inaccuracy in the report in there. Yeah, I think so. But has it been added on to Morelos's uh, transfer fee? You think <laughs> is that is that what the papers have allocated? It? <laughs> is it, the papers have allocated it to Morelos's transfer fee there, um, as they, as they try to how come all around Europe? It is difficult for us to I mean. We all know that we are going to we are going to sell players, and for me, if we if we are going to sell Rodic, we will also sell Cham. I think uh, for me, it was quite clear that uh, Cham was one of the players that Lennon was um, talking about when he had post um, the post European tie as well when, when we got put out. So, it's maybe that we are going to lose both of them. But it seems that we're still interested in a, a, a another left-hand-sided a midfielder as well from Charlton, a Al- Alfie Do- 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 Doherty, is it? Doherty or Doherty or Doherty? Doherty, I think. Uh, he's 20-year-old, yep. uh, six foot, and he's only played 41 senior games. Uh, for Charlton, eh? mm-hmm. so it must admit that we're still we're, we're still looking to bring in players as well. But th- this transfer window seems to be dragging. I mean, I did say I did say last week that I was uh, I felt like I was locked in a cupboard when waiting on Shane Duffy to actually sign. Absolutely, uh, Absolutely. and it and it took took ages for the Duffy deal to get through get Absolutely. get get put through. And I noticed Shane Duffy, I watched the Republic Ireland game yesterday uh, against Finland and it was really interesting to see him getting absolutely roasted by Timo Puke for... Uh, Did for you say interesting? It was, yes. I, I would say concerning. Uh, no, it's not concerning. <laughs> Duffy's came out himself and says he's hardly played football in a year and he's not match fit. He played 90 minutes on Friday night. Uh, Thursday night it was actually when he scored the equaliser and to play two ninety minutes as quick as that he found it tiring. So what I'll just say is uh, we love everybody that tunes into these bulletins, Kevin, because the, the cameras dropped out there for a few moments and nobody complained. I don't know what that says about us. <laughs> I don't know what that says about us, but we're back. We're back up and running visual and uh, audio and visual. But the, the thing with Shane Duffy, obviously there was this um, element of the Celtic fan base, me being part of that, that were just so excited about him signing. And then he scores that great kind of last minute goal. Um, and then we've got the we've got the, the issues of him getting roasted by... Uh, Timo Puki, who I mean, this happens though, doesn't it? I mean, we go through, we have gone through so many strikers that we've maybe paid between two and three million pounds for. The list would be in. It's a podcast in itself. We'll probably talk about it at some stage. And uh, you ask yourself how many of them have actually come to fruition. Strikers buying strikers in has been a bit of an issue for us. You know, mm-hmm. you can talk about your successes of Dembele. Bit of an anomaly, the fact that we managed to get him for the price we did. Eduard, massive amount of investment and a kid who was playing for the under-19s team over in France. Um, so it's it's definitely an issue for us, but Pookie, when you said that, just brought back memories of him, you know, being really just not good enough for Celtic. But I'm not saying he's not a good enough player, it's just he did not fit in with the way Celtic were playing. And, and I can't explain that, we've had so many of them, Bangura, we could start listing them, you know, and it goes on and on. One player who may or may not be in that category and hopefully is not going to be as Klamala now that you brought up international football and he scored another he scored a goal for the under 21s Polish side so um, it was interesting the success stories that we had I've mentioned Eduard his goal scoring record for the under his French sides is, are quite f- frightening I think he's scored more goals than he's played games um, so what, what was your whole take overall from a Celtic perspective on the international games so far? Um, obviously I watched the Scotland game um, the first game I watched was the Republic of Ireland game away in Bulgaria, uh, basically just to watch Shane Duffy. And he didn't, I, I expected to see this big, and we spoke about yeah. this last week, the no nonsense centre half. Whereas he seemed with the Republic of Ireland, he let his partner do the duel with the, with, the, with the Bulgarian forwards, and he sat deep and just sort of mopped up. Again, that could be a fitness issue with him, it could so. be just make it. Uh, 
edging himself back into the games. He scored a decent header. He looked he looked comfortable enough on the ball. Uh, the Scotland game, Scotland game was poor. James Forrest didn't play very well. Like well, let's, James Forrest had a quiet game. I'm not going to say that he didn't play very well. Ryan Christie scored a fantastic penalty. Um, it was great to see Kieran Tierney back in. I can it's a Celtic thing, but it's still great to see Kieran Tierney yeah. back in a um, in a Cel- in a Scotland jersey play, playing really really well. Um, on Saturday night, I watched the Sweden against France. And there you go, there's big mad mental Mikael Lustig still playing right back for Sweden. Right, talk to still, us still, about still, his... still playing left, but right back for Talk Sweden, to us eh? about his performance then, Kevin, because I mean that was a, another big discussion point on the podcast, whether or not Lustig should have been playing, uh, or sorry, re-signed. I mean, the last thing we remember him doing is setting up uh, Eduard to win us the Scottish Cup. He's a cult hero, but not, you know, further than that, he was a very successful Celtic player. Definitely, but what does it say about... Uh, the, the depth of Swedish football. Have they not got another right back that can come in and uh, play right back? I mean, he, he, he gave a typical latter Celtic year L- Mikael Lustig performance for yeah. Sweden. He, he could see that his leg, he wasn't as quick as what he used to be. You can see that he, he's a bit more stecky, if that's even a word, mm-hmm. um, than what he used to be. He couldn't handle Mbappe when Mbappe went up alongside him, but then there's no many there's there's no yeah. many there's no many fullbacks can handle Mbappe eh, when he, when he's on his game. But how was his mobility, Kevin? That was always my biggest concern about uh, Lustig. You know, coming through the the kind of latter stages of his Celtic he, career, he just looked like the latter stage Mikel Lustig that he was with us. He had issues with his hips, didn't he? Uh, he runs funny. Eh? He runs that he sort of stiff way. Now and, and but there he was. He was still playing right back for Sweden yeah. in a a nations nations league tie, and I'm going. That's that's unreal. That's a player that we got rid of. Yeah. And what do you think? What do you think we were right to get rid of him, or what was uh, your thoughts on? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think that he, he was beginning to slow, and as you say, he had his issues with his mobility and his hips, and um, it was maybe time for him to move on. But I, I don't know. I didn't know he was playing. I didn't watch the game. <laughs> I'm, I'm now going to, to be honest. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I still loved him as a player. I, I thought he was um, great, and it, yeah, I think his time at Celtic was good. But it was we were right to get rid of him because he was no longer kind of fitting into the squad. He wasn't much fit. He was kind of slower than he had been. That's what happens. I mean, right. we, we lost Samaras in similar circumstances Absolutely. whereby, you know, they're looking at the contract, they're looking to give them less wages. And that's where it comes down to, Kevin. You know, I think if it was a football decision, we should have kept Samaras. If it was a football decision, we definitely should have kept uh, Lustig in, in relation to just being that backup right back and centre half. But when you're paying that amount of money because yeah. they've built that and they're, they're deserving of the wage because they've built themselves up mm-hmm. to be an important member of the squad, then it gets to the point where they're looking at the age, they're looking at all these uh, factors, and if they're not prepared to take either a shorter deal or lesser wages, then they're going to have to go. So great that he's still playing, great that he's playing in international football. But I, I agree with you, I think it was time yeah. for him to go. Have we replaced them? Well, we brought in. Uh, El Hamid, who I think is a very accomplished mm-hmm. defender, he's good at going forward. I've always got a wee niggling, uh, can you know, worry about him getting injured. I think that there is that worry, but I do think he's an excellent player. But right back is a position I also think we're lacking in because I don't regard Frimpong as a right back. I think he's he's a right sided forward attacking player who is back up to James Forrest. Mm-hmm. So we might. It'd be great if we could get an old fashioned full back who could play right or left. But I mean, then you're moving into the realms of Danny McGrain and they, they don't come round too often, do they? Have we maybe got a higher notion of the level of player that should be playing with us? Because I'm sure that we have, but Mikael Lustig left us and went to a team in Belgium that qualified for the Champions League. Yeah. And now he's moved back to Sweden and he's still playing for the Swedish national team. So do we set our bar too high on what we want to see? Or I'm just 
thrown that out there. It, it, it probably, I, I thought it was, it was loose tig's time to go as well. But when you see some of the players that leave us still playing at a decent level years after they left us, and you're like, Paul's right, it's a financial decision with the yeah. majority of them, eh? mm-hmm. and you still, and that boy could have done a job for us, even even in the dressing room. Yeah. No, there is that yeah, as well. The influence, uh, the influence in the dressing room. He yeah. was he was like a captain, wasn't he? The way that he conducted himself. But then you end up <coughs> at the Martin O'Neill stage. You do, you do. You, you can't have that aging squad. When you've got an aging squad there who are on massive money. The way that Celtic will look at it as a business, yeah. Kevin, like you've mentioned, is they'll say, well, let's say it's Frimpong that, that came in as the right back. Is there a sell-on uh, possibility to make a profit on him? Absolutely. You know, what age is he? 19. You know, so they're looking at that model all the time, aren't they? Yeah. And then the sentimentality that you and I have when you think about, you know, wearing police hats and putting his jersey or his top and all that kind of stuff, that goes out the window because it's just business. It's just cold, hard business for, yeah. for the Celtic uh, decision makers to the point where players are actually let go that Neil Lennon probably wanted to keep because I think he wanted to keep Johnny Hayes. But he's let go. So no comparing Hayes to, to Lustig. I know that there was discussion last week about Hayes um, that was quite scathing in terms of his performances, although I think he was a very successful player in you know, relation to what he won with the club. Um, we're now without a left back. But I'm not saying he, he overnight becomes Paolo Maldini. But, you know, uh, we've left ourselves short there, haven't we? Definitely. And it's... I, f- I think Greg Taylor's getting a hard time. Um, I've said that on this podcast before, that Greg Taylor is getting a hard, t- hard time because he's not Kieran Tierney. And there's no there hasn't been many Kieran Tierneys that have came through Celtic since Danny McGrain. So, so you're comparing them to one of the greatest fullbacks yeah. that we've ever produced. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's back to what you've just said about do we have any elevated idea of who will play and who should play for Celtic. Mm-hmm. Kieran Tierney was, in a lot of ways, an anomaly to have that talent and so young. To look to replace that in that way is completely unreasonable, but it doesn't mean you can't get another good player in the squad in that place. It's just, um, it's rose-tinted glasses looking back, can we get another one? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there's nothing no, wrong no, with no, having that. There's nothing wrong with that, no. but it's, sometimes you've got to give the player who replaces an absolute star mm. man cool. time cool. to develop cool. into Aye. that role. Absolutely. Yeah, and there is that. And we don't, personally... We maybe didn't do that. Mm-hmm. We maybe don't do that. I'll stick up for Greg Taylor all season. I will. Uh, I've well, we need, that. we need I, I, that. I've already said that. I will That's stick fine. up for Greg Taylor. I reckon, I reckon he, he's, he's got it and he just needs time to bed himself into that side. Right, well, we shall see as the season develops, Kevin, because we're here on a daily basis during the week. And then uh, if we're playing at the weekend, we also cover those games as well, Kevin. And obviously the game coming up is Ross County. So looking ahead to the, the next fixture, what's your thoughts on the Ross County game away from home? We'll be watching it here. We'll need to buy it as a VIP kind of box office package. I think it's 15 quid, is that right? 15 quid. First and foremost, let's have a wee think about that for a second, right? Let's take a wee diversion. We're always, well, I, I'm always looking at some of the, the kind of decisions within Scottish football and questioning why, you know, clubs just don't seem to have a forward-thinking kind of business attitude. And uh, I spoke to you about it during the period of time when Dunfermline were in administration and I managed to see behind the curtain, as it were, because we were fundraising at the time to try and save the club, me and a group of friends. And uh, one of them was Mikey Mikovic, who's obviously a good pal of the show as well. And you've seen a lot of things within the inner workings of a football club at a reasonable level that you thought, wow, that's the basics. You're getting the basics wrong there. And by the way, I think they're in good hands now. I think Ross MacArthur and his team have done a great job. And obviously there was a massive investment uh, last week, which is great. I'd love to see Dunfermline back in the Premier League, personally. Mm-hmm. Um, so... There's a lot of things going on in football clubs that they, they get criticised about. You know, they just don't have the business uh, now. So, you know, they just don't have the forward thinking marketing. Um, you know, they just don't have the ideas or the creativity. So what you then get is you get a situation, Kevin, where we're speaking to Saul Davis from James, who, because of, or maybe prior to um, the pandemic, he's thinking about live music. So going back to the point you made, whereby your whole industry is just, you know, the rug's pulled from under your feet. There's nowhere to perform. There's nowhere to make money. People are then thinking, well, let's do something online. Um, everywhere you looked, there was Zoom calls, Zoom calls. We got a bit 
sick of seeing the site of Zoom calls, Absolutely. so we decided to do something a wee bit different with regards to live streaming from the studio, live and interactive. And um, so Saul Davis comes up with this idea, and his idea was that, who's your favourite band, Victoria? Who's your favourite band, all time? Oh, the Stone Roses. The Stone Roses, wow, superb. We could do a Stone Roses podcast <laughs> at some stage. Uh, on that note, before I, I, I probably lose my train of thought, Ian Brown, right, with his mass comments, did you see John Squire came on and made a yeah. counter? Yeah. Well done, Squire. Well, what I'm, I just want to say one thing on that. Obviously, folk who are surprised that Ian Brown's made these comments, <laughs> I've never heard any of his interviews in the last 20 years because oh, he's, he's a conspiracy. Yeah. He, he, he's always... Against the establishment. He's against the establishment. Um, I think what happens though, and what surprised me is that he's so influential. And see, when you have that position of influence on such a subject as this, whereby, oh, I didn't wear a mask, right? What happens if your granny ends up in hospital with, with COVID? I mean, I like a good conspiracy theory as well, Kevin, like the best of them, like, you know. You know, Stanley Kubrick obviously filmed the moon landing, but at the end of the day, you didn't want anybody's family member to end up in a situation where they end up in hospital because they're being, you know, flagrant with the rules. It's like, pff, disregard that. No, you can't disregard it. That's a serious place. I'm, I'm, I don't know. It's a conspiracy theory, and you, you see them, there's thousands of them now at the weekend going out and, like, a protesting in Croatia and places like that as well, eh? And it's, it's just fear. It's just, I think it's just a, pop, it's a population we're, we're, we're gripped to be fear of the unknown. So Ian Brown to fear, well done, like that. Yeah, I could write a wee poem. Aye. Exhaustic poem about that. <laughs> C-O-V-I-D, you could do one of their ones. <laughs> oh, no. So the Stone Roses, there you go. The Stone Roses. Also, if I was to say my favourite band of all time, now, when they, let's say, when they were kicking about doing gigs, they go on a world tour, and there's 30 dates or 50 dates. How many dates are normally on a world tour? I don't know. So you look at them and you say, well, let's go to the Glasgow gig, let's go and see them at Hamden or whatever. So Saul Davis, being part of a massive band, James, who sold 30 million albums worldwide, he came up with this platform whereby you could buy a ticket for any gig and watch it remotely, and basically they would have a production team mm-hmm. at the gig. So the production team are filming it. It's going live. I think there was an eight second lag on the the live, uh, which is better sometimes than some of the <laughs> the Celtic footage that we watch, which is sometimes a couple of minutes behind. But it's all kosher, by the way. Season ticket footage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just got to get that in there. So that was his idea. So let's say you're a Rosie's fan. They released twenty odd dates. You can watch every single one of them, and you can pay a one off year like a season ticket. You can buy a tour ticket, watch the whole lot from the comfort of your living room. And he set that platform up, and that that's there. I think it's absolutely necessary to do something mm-hmm. and to actually monetize the art that you're making as well. When when coronavirus first happened, loads of people were online doing gigs for free, giving away older free content. That's again not sustainable. But I, but I want to watch twenty Stone Roses gigs online. No, because first of all, Ian Brown, I'd love him. Can he sing? Secondly, does he not use auto tune these days? Oh, it, <laughs> nah. I would rather just be there once. I would rather be there once. And, every and time. in person? Aye, every time. So, as good as it is to put a stopgap in or another platform that can be used, it's never going to replace live art. And we have to be thinking creatively and safely about how we can get people in front of a stage again. Mm-hmm. Um, and into a football ground. And into a football ground, absolutely. Yep. Because it's. I mean, you know, I don't know how you guys have felt even just watching football matches just now, but I, for the best of my, I, I can't get into it. I was actually see that when the ball hits the back of the net and there's no crowd roar, it's actually soul destroying. Mm-hmm. And you look at Celtic Park and the way they've laid out, you know, the Magnus, Adidas, there's no uh. kind of, you look at Anfield and there's supporter buses, things and stuff yeah. everywhere. Yep. It, it's it's no the same and instead of saying oh we'll just put it online and charge you the same price as we would anyway we should be seeing how we're actually going to make this a community sport or a community art and make it accessible mm-hmm. so not to rubbish what's, what's happened there um, I've got friends in Glasgow doing something very similar um, but it should always be a instead of for now mm-hmm. my worry is that that becomes that becomes the norm, the norm. and of course 
the the reason we've started speaking about that subject is Ross County have uh, obviously announced details of the VIP link, which is going to cost 15 quid to go uh, and watch. And on one hand, I think to myself, is that a worldwide link, Kevin, just before I go on to this point? I think it's for... I, I, so anybody in the world can watch that game by paying 15 quid? Or is it not just... Because there's different regions and different permissions regions and all that kind of thing. Because the game's not on a satellite channel, I think they might it might be only Britain. I'm going to ask you a question. You like but the, but the, you, can, 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 is the Ross County server going to uh, be able to handle the thousands of folk that are going to log on? The Celtic one can it? I know, but Castori can uh, sell 100,000 jerseys in three hours and the server can deal with that. So what I was going to ask you, right, you, you love the St. Pauli thing, right? Yes. You love that. They were, as they, I, as they, do they I. They were live on YouTube yesterday. Well, I was going to ask you, right, imagine you and I can't go to Germany to watch them. Maybe I've been once, I've been to Hamburg once to immerse myself in the St Pauli thing I didn't actually see a game I watched it they were playing Nuremberg and I watched it in the Jolly Roger they were playing away so because the girls said that they don't show the games if they're playing at home they only show the away games in the Jolly right. Roger somebody can correct me online if that's wrong but that's what I was told anyway if they gave you an opportunity to buy a virtual season ticket and you could watch all their games live on a beautiful wee stream on your laptop etc etc in that scenario where it isn't a case of you um, denying them cash because you would never be at the game. Would you do something like that? I think I would. I would. I would. If, it, if the price was a reasonable price, and I, I'm never going to go to the games, maybe once or twice in a lifetime, um, unlike Nick, who you interviewed, who actually goes, I think, half a dozen times a season, season normally, yeah. would you buy the season ticket? Probably. I mean, if it was a good package, you know, you're a, you're a virtual season ticket holder. I'm looking at worldwide fan bases. So, could Celtic develop a, a a season ticket for the worldwide fan base? You might say, well, that's Celtic TV. But, again, it's one of these things whereby you've got to look at St. Pauli, for example, or I don't think there's any clubs in, in Scotland have got that appeal other than Celtic. Uh, then, it's the whole it's the whole TV rights, eh? because you've got overseas TV rights. I mean, Celtic would make far far more money doing that than what they get from the current TV deal. Would you buy the season ticket for St. Pauli if it was a virtual ticket? Depends on the price. Yeah, I've, I've got two wins and <laughs> like but then going to see Celtic and that it takes It's an up, interesting it, debate it though. Takes you know? up the majority oh, of my weekend. But say it was 40 quid for the season. Well, I would go, all right, I'll pay the 40 and that, quid. And that's 40 quid they would never have. Uh, that's 40 quid they would never have and I would be like, well, if I see five or six games, I've actually got my money's worth it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, aye, be, de- depending on the price. Yeah. It would have to be have to be that reasonably priced, I would. Yeah. Part of me thinks I, I would buy it. I mean, I, I like the St. Pauli thing as well. Mm-hmm. I, I would buy it. However, the comparison with Celtic is, I mean, St. Pauli are a very different position where they're playing football. You know, they're a very different mm-hmm. size of club. They've got a different kind of ethos and outreach so it might be beneficial to Mm -hmm. St Pauli to put it out there that doesn't necessarily mean it would be beneficial for us in the same way or if the same model would transfer equally it might be something to look at but maybe not for every game maybe for I I don't know it just um, St Pauli is one of those sides where it does attract a kind of cult following all over Europe. I can see, actually, I know that people would probably buy that season ticket. Mm-hmm. Um, would Celtic get more revenue out of, as you say, televised mm-hmm. matches? And that's a big question, I think. No, definitely. We've spoke, we've spoke about uh, an Atlantic League mm. a couple of times on moving down to England. And yeah. if Celtic done that, moved out of the border of Scotland, we would then become everybody in the Irish diaspora's favourite team in America, or, uh, Australia. Worldwide? We, we would become their second favourite team because we would then have that platform. I think we're already the second favourite team of, of a lot of people uh, with that background. Yeah, I and so. I think, you know, if you then elevate the club to the higher league, then you're going neck and neck, let's say, against the Liverpool. You know, yeah. and that that is the biggie. That's the biggie. If we do manage to get that, and um, I would love us to go to that level and become like a Saint Pauli at that level. I'd love us to get rid of the short advertising, like Aye. because we're getting that much money 
tenor tickets make the place an absolute cauldron and become that sort of cult club that a lot of us do see us as. But this is also that that um and and it's harking back to bygone eras almost, but that's always what attracted me to Celtic. It mm-hmm. was it's my local team, it's my community team. It had the Irish diaspora links there, so it was kinda connected to my family and our history and kind of, and the ethos of their support mm-hmm. and the kind of community aspect of that is almost as important, if not as important, as who you actually play in the pitch. And um, there's a big part of me that, yeah, thinks it's too expensive, it's too corporate, get, get people in, make it affordable and make it cool, man, you know? Aye. And, yeah, I would like to see that too, but I also know it's a complete fantasy oh, on my we part, kid, probably. We, we, we would kid on my Man United, didn't it? <laughs> that, that's, that's, <laughs> I'd rather than Beeson Pauly. You look at Liverpool, Liverpool are a global brand, but they've managed to keep that community yes. feeling about them. Yep. And it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard day. It's a tightrope. You can either go one way or the other. And you look at you look at Man United. Man United have probably sold their soul to the devil quite a few times over. Yeah, and, and I, yeah, and I think we're in danger of that. You look at a lot of kind of like the Cano Foundation. You mm-hmm. know, to getting kids in every week and things like that. It's absolutely fantastic. But let's be honest. I mean, you know yourself. You know, it's no easy to take a full family to a football game. No, so. I would rather take my son every Sunday that we were at home and be able to do it than, you know, have big sponsorship. Maybe, it's a, maybe this is where the cult yeah. idea would come in. Would they be they a could, cult club? Uh, they could become a cult club. They could be. Uh, they, they could become, like, if Celtic move on to wherever they move on to, then, mm-hmm. the, then Victoria could take her son to mm-hmm. Clyde to watch Cel- the Celtic Colts. And it might be absolutely mental. <laughs> it, could, it could could well be. It could well be. And Danny Lennon might be playing. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you join us today. It was brilliant. And uh, people can visit you on Twitter and, and get involved in making this fanzine work and grow and give people like Kevin a platform. <laughs> We're getting some comments on here about your poem. So well done, Kevin. Sorry to throw you under a bus there, but um, you done well. Well done. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to come back for the first time since Friday to talk all about Celtic. Uh, from myself, Victoria and Kevin, thank you all for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind. Thank you. Thank you.